but without further ado, I'm gonna ask Marina Morante to start. Marina is a, she lives in uh, Barcelona. She's a member of the Committee for the Republican Catalonia Defense. Yeah, yeah more, more or less. less. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's gonna start. Yeah, okay. First of all, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I think that this is how we can build the internationalism, sharing and fighting together against the exploitation and the oppression, wherever it is. So the last time that I was here in London, I was in a, student, a student's meeting, and I was talking about the need of a, a company and be near our classmates and our neighbors in the struggle, and also the need to participate in the social movements, but also to be organized with a political pro program, with a political strategy, uh, not for only a concrete ca um, cause, but for a global change, okay? But today I'm going to, to talk about how we live uh, some important dates in Catalonia in my neighborhood, in No Barris. No Barris is a working class traditional working class neighborhood and it was really it was a really really strong uh, struggle there in in my neighborhood so first of all i'm going to to speak about the 1st of october the first the 1st of october was the date when we celebrate the referendum okay it was an experience of self organization of our neighborhoods the the spanish state was saying the days before you are not going to vote you are not going to vote but yes we vote the 1st of october we vote in our um, voting stations, stations. yeah thank you so um, i'm sure that we achieve this this goal because People was organized, and people was organized in assemblies, and people was working together. So that was the reason why uh, why we could vote the first of October. So people empo empower uh, empowered themselves and defend with their bodies the voting stations. Um, no worries, my neighborhood was the most attacked uh, neighborhood in all Catalonia. Uh, one f uh, of three uh, voting stations were attacked of the, uh, by the police, but we resist because the police thought that, okay, my neighborhood is really poor and also is a migrant neighborhood. So the police thought that it was really easy to stop the referendum there. But it wasn't easy because we resist. Uh, an, an anecdote was in Thomas Moro uh, voting, voting a station because we had a, a six uh, ballot boxes, but we only put in the table three of the six, okay, and the other three we put in, in our room. So when the police came, they took the, the ballot boxes. Well, they destroy all the schools. They hit my grandmother, my mother. So it was a, a terrible situation. But they took the ballot boxes. And uh, the neighbors started a demonstration against the police. And we take out of the neighborhood. And then when the police was out of the neighborhood, we take, uh, we talk another time, the other where wallet or boxes, and we continued uh, to vote uh, or vote. So it was an amazing, amazing experience of self-organized uh, people. Uh, in, every, in, in every voting station, people organized themselves in assemblies, okay? It was the beginning of the CDRs, the Committees in Defense of the Republic. The Committees in Defense of the Republic are assemblies of the neighbors in every neighborhood or in, a, on, or in every village where people can um, say whatever they want and people can fight for, for the yeah, the 1st of October for the referendum, and now for the Republic. Um, there were more than 300 assemblies in the um, October, November, yeah, 
more than 3,000 assemblies, and every assembly uh, had more than uh, 100 people. In, so we were a lot of people organized in assemblies in Catalonia. Um, the first uh, thing we organized as CDRs was the general strike in the 3rd of October. Um, we organized uh, demonstrations from every village, from every neighborhood to the center of uh, Barcelona to make the big demonstration. And in No Barris, we achieved a demonstration of uh, 40,000 neighborhoods in a poor and migrant district neighborhood. It's a lot of people. So uh, after the 3rd of October, we made an assembly where we decide uh, to link the national struggle, the self-determination struggle, and the social uh, struggle. Uh, because we trust, we trust that the independence of Catalonia could be a good way to destroy the structural re Spanish regime, who uh, well, what um, well, yeah, who, who oppress and explodes all the working class, not only Catalan working class, also from Andalusia, also from Euskal Herria, also from Asturias. So we trust in it, and we start to um, to participate in the social social movements as the CDR. So the CDR of No Barris uh, goes to the ev evacuations, no evictions, sorry, evictions house, to a house evictions. Yeah, house evictions to a stop it. So we think that this also our struggle, not only self determination <laughs> struggle. And so in my opinion, the best day to proclaim the independence was the third of October because it was when the thousands of people were in the street empowered to defend the republic. And then, some months later, uh, the, the Spanish state imposed us uh, an elections, and we, we went to elections. In my opinion, uh, the best, I don't know, but the best way uh, was maybe would be to to create an active boycott to these elections because we vote the first of October. So it, the, these elections was a way to uh, deslegitimate or referendum, and also um, it was a way. To, you know, before the elections, the focus was in the street because the people was every week every week in the street, in demonstrations, general strike. So the focus was in the street. But after the elections, the focus was in, the, in all, another time in the institution. And we as Marxists know that where we win the struggles, the battles, is in the street, not in the institutions. No. So uh, the, the elections of the 21st of December um, make a, um, uh, David, a um, turning point. Turning point. Turning point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it, for me, it was the moment when the movement started to decrease, because we were like here. And after the elections, the movement started to, to decrease. So in my opinion, there are some things uh, to reflect about. First of all, that the um, independence of Catalonia hits the structure of the Spanish regime. So the Spanish state is going to do wherever they can to avoid the self-determination of Catalonia, wherever they can, uh, with political prisoners. <coughs> so this struggle is going to be really large and really hard. Second, uh, this, the first point means for me that we need more than the 50% in favor, in favor of the republic. So we need to win all the working class for a republic with all the social rights guaranteed. Um, we won't achieve to win the working class if we support the, the Catalan bourgeois and their policies. Uh, we can say um, 
okay, we want social rights. And then when uh, Catalan po police is uh, catching people who is occup occupying homes because they they don't have anywhere to 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 live, keep in silence. So we can't do that. If we are for social rights, we are in the fight of the social rights. Not only talking. We don't need uh, talks. We need facts. So, in my opinion, some political parties of independent political party have to understand that. That we can talk, we can say, yeah, the Catalan Republic is going to be uh, a good solution for you. Yeah, but if you are with the uh, Catalan bourgeois, it's not really. So, um, Mm, so the question for me is not about the Spanish versus Catalan feelings. It's about a republic with social rights or a monarchy without it. This is the question. It's not about a uh, discussion of nationalism, Catalans are better. No, I don't know. My family uh, is from Andalusia or my neighborhood. All the people, their parents are from, uh, from Andalusia or Galicia. So it's not the question. The question is about human rights and social rights. So um, to finish, uh, for me, the unite of action is necessary to achieve concrete goals. But as working class, we also need our own political strategy to build the society that we want here or in Catalonia. We have to make, to create our own strategy, not all, always with the hand of the, of the bourgeois in this type of process. So, that's all. Thank you, Marina. That was great. Um, I'm going to introduce now Marie Capretz. She lives, Marie lives in Berlin, and she's a member of the International Committee of Esquerda Republicana de Catalunya. Yeah? Good. So I did well. Uh, Republic, which is the Republican left of Catalunya. Marie. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My voice is not as strong as hers, so is that okay? Do you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, my work, in fact, had been in Berlin re in the recent years to explain what's going on in Catalonia, and I'm, I hopefully can go back to that job. Um, and uh, it's my first time that I explain it in English, so please be patient with me. <laughs> um, so, uh, what is Esquerra Republicana? Esquerra Republicana is a party that was founded in 1931, um, in times back then Spain was a republic, and uh, it's uh, a left-wing party that's not based on Marxism. And now is the moment, and you can kick me out, in <laughs> <laughs> but if not, then I will speak further. Um, so. The ideology of Esquerra Republicana is that of a republic. And what's a republic? That every citizen should be equal uh, before the law and has uh, had civic rights, etc., which is not the case in a democracy. And we have to remember that Spain is still a democracy. A monarchy. Sorry, a monarchy. <laughs> a monarchy. Um, so back then, in the 30s, um, Esquerra Republicana was uh, in power. They uh, had several um, presidents in Catalonia, and uh, two. They did two attempts of proclaiming the Republic, Independent Republic of Catalonia. One with President Francesc Macià, and the other one uh, with President Lluís Companys, which later on was uh, shot and executed by Franco. Um, so we have experience in proclaiming an independent state. Uh, Esquerra Republicana now uh, is deeply involved in this process. And I think it's not only in the streets. It's also necessary that there are parties and the, the political representatives being uh, in every place they can be uh, in order to explain what's going on in the streets. 
and not only. So we, our current situation is that we have attempted several times to proclaim a Catalan Republic, but maybe it's the first time that we have reached so far. And now going back again in history, uh, during dictatorship and Franco, obviously Esquerra Republicana was prohibited and exiled and many of them, of the democratic ele democratically elected politicians around Catalonia had been suffering from repression and um, because they were advocating for their ideals. And, uh, but once Franco died, um, Esquerra Republicana turned back to, to Spain and to Catalonia. And what they didn't manage and manage was one thing they managed was that they could deeply root in all the Catalan territory. So they are in the villages and in Barcelona, not only in the big capitals, but there are many mayors from Esquerra Republicana. But on the other hand, they, after the dictatorship, they re didn't really manage to get into real power, let's say. It was a small party until uh, 2011, more or less. What happened in 2011? Um, Oriol Junqueras and Marta Rovira became president and secretary of the organization of Esquerra Republicana, and they did a deep reorganization and renewal of the party from within. And that, um, uh, has, as a result, we have now a very modern and trouble-resistant organization, and no one single corruption case in all of these 80 years, which obviously is also for historical reasons. So, as an example, 1999, Escarpicana was about 8.7 percent of uh, of the uh, voters, and uh, in the December 21 elections last year, Escarpicana gained 21 and a half percent of the votes, mm. which is very well. There's one point I want to underline that this relatively well, well good um, result of the elections uh, was in spite that Oriol Junqueras is in preventive prison since November 2nd. So he couldn't partake in the electoral campaign. And I think that was an, a clear intent of the, of the Spanish government. They didn't want him to run as a candidate, and that's what, that's why he was prevented from doing it by being in preventive prison. And Marta Rovira is in exile in Geneva since March 22nd. She's also accused of rebellion and, um, how do you call that? Sedition. Malversation of funds? Uh, um, basically, <laughs> stealing <laughs> public money. Okay. Corruption. Cor well, yeah. <laughs> Misuse Embezzle. of public money. Um, yeah. 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 Embezzling, embezzlement. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in fact, all this, we have now, right now, nine democratically elected politicians from Catalonia imprisoned without trial. They are preventively pr in prison. And seven politicians in exile in Brussels, in Germany, and in Geneva, and in Scotland. Um, that is not a normal situation in the 21st century. We can't accept that. And it's not <coughs> only, these politicians are not only from Esquerra Republicana, they are also from the Liberal Party. And from CUP, we have also an exiled person in Geneva. So, you may know all these international warrants that were pronounced against the exiled politicians that are still, um, they're still searching for them, and in Brussels, for instance, they rejected it for the four politicians in Brussels, which was really correct, I think, that the correct thing to do. Uh, we are still waiting for the decision of the German court uh, about Puigdemont, and then in Scotland, there's still the Clara Ponsati case going on, as you might know. 
Well, um, as we heard before, um, Spain, after the referendum of October 1st, um, dissoluted, did the dissolution of dissolved, dissolved the Catalan government. Um, and I think after October 1st, there was, an, on the emotional basis, people were really confused because there was this attempt of declaring an independent uh, republic, but there were, then there were uh, promises of negotiation, so uh, Puigdemont kept the, the declaration of independence because he wanted to negotiate, he wanted dialogue, which never happened. And then all these ex exile and prison uh, cases went on, and uh, people were really confused, I think. Like, it's n never happened in democracy, such a thing. <coughs> then we had the 21st December elections, which I consider quite unfair, because we had all this politician that couldn't campaign. I think, or I could imagine that they theoretically are the best politicians we have because they're representative. So they couldn't uh, compete. And on the other hand, the unionist parties, they had every <coughs> facilities and a lot of money to campaign. But still, the independent parties won and they are now um, absolute majority again in, in the Catalan parliament. But um, with the 47% of the votes. How is that possible? So we have 47%, nearly 50% of the voters are in favor of the independence. Then we have 43% um, against the independence, and the rest is in pro of a referendum. That's important to know because people think, tend to think it's 50-50. So in fact, it's not really 50-50. We have three um, parts in the parliament, and the majority is pro-independent. We have to say that because it's sometimes in the news and you don't really understand what's going on. Hmm. So now we have a new government after these elections and after some troubles to, to be there. So, um, and the Esquerra Republicana is con convinced that it is necessary to broaden the, the social support or the support of voters in favor of the independence movement. And that's what they do in Madrid, in the Senate and the parliament. That's what they do abroad, in places like we are here. And in Catalonia itself, uh, it's, all, it's very necessary that um, certain areas of Barcelona get in contact with the independence movement because um, the hegemonic parties are still very strong there and the unionist parties. And then we have like um, politicians like Najat Trueck and Chahir El Humrani, which are of Moroccan um, roots and they defend the, um, the things that people from the new Catalans as we know them they defend their interests and in change they talk up with them about the independence movement because we think <coughs> that a republic is a place where everybody can live its own, his, his or her own life as he wishes to do. So what's the horizon? Um, there could be a new referendum but with international guarantees and based on article one of the International Convenant of Civil and Political Rights. And we are not willing to leave that path and we are advocating for peaceful resistance. People wonder about that sometimes, but this peaceful resistance and dem democracy and dialogue is key in this Catalan movement. And what we need now, right now, is the, the political prisoners to be released and the exiled um, politicians to be allowed to come back home. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for a very good contribution.
presentation, I'm going to introduce now David Carvala. Um, David is, uh, lives in Barcelona as well, and uh, is a member of uh, Marx 21, which is the sister organization of the SWP in the Spanish state, and is also one of the promoters of uh, With Catalunya Solidarity Campaign. David. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, I want to say loads of things, but I probably don't have time. First thing I'd say is it's symbolic and symptomatic of the Catalan movement that we have three speakers here. Marina, she said, from Andalus parents. Marie, who's German, and I was born in Finland. And we are part of the Catalan <laughs> movement. Um, and nobody questions that, apart from the, the right-wing Spanish centralists. Say, How is it possible if you're not born in Catalonia and with loads of <laughs> grandparents from Catalonia? Because it's not that sort of movement. I got a letter two days ago from a friend who's been in prison since the 1st of October, uh, 16th of October, Johnny Couchard, who's the um, president of uh, Omnium Cultural. One of the things he said is this. He said, what we are living through is a people's revolution. Makes me think of the anti-globalization movement in Seattle, the Indignados movement, the Arab revolts. People want to be free. And all this comes from the people, not the traditional parties. I think this is a very good summary of how to start looking at the Catalan movement. Don't start thinking about nationalist movements. Don't think about people here with uh, the English flag. Don't think about the Liga Nord in Italy. Think about the Indignados movement. Think about the Arab Spring. Think about the people that go into the mass rallies for Corbyn or that come out into the street for Bernie Saunders. It's that sort of movement with all of, many of those sort of contradictions, but it is not an ethnic, nationalist, racist movement. That's the first thing to say. Secondly, following on from what um, has already been said, about nine political prisons, in fact, m more, because there's people in prison uh, or, or under, under threat, threat of prison, like rappers, for having son against a monarchy. Uh, works of art suspended. Uh, in fact, the rapper Voltonic is, is actually in Brussels now as, a, as an exile to not go into prison. While fascist people have attacked and, and carried out fascist attacks are free, despite having been condemned to prison. Um, the police brutality on the 1st of October has been mentioned. A thousand people injured on the 1st of October. Um, and the negation of, of, of democracy. All of these things should make it clear that any person, you don't have to be on the radical revolutionary left, any basic person on the left, even any d progressive or democratic person should support this movement against the repression. Then you can agree or not about independence or about this or that tactical question. It should be absolutely clear. Sadly, it isn't. Um, with the Spanish left, uh, there are very good people in the Spanish left who work very hard over this question. But overall, it has to be said that the Spanish left has not been up to the situation. I mean, this is not novel. I mean, if you look at the British left in Ireland, it's, or the French left in Algeria, it's part of the same thing. Uh, but now, was in the 21st century, we suppose that we're all democratic. Um, and so, well, the Socialist Party is not a surprise. I mean, they had death squads against Basque activists in the 1990s. They joined NATO, so the fact that they're not that in favor of democracy, and they're not horror struck about a thousand people being injured for trying to vote, is not surprising. But people did have more hopes in Podemos. Podemos was a new, a new start. It, they said they supported the right of self-determination. But in the end, it turned out they supported a different sort of self-determination than the one that people tried to self-determine. So they were in favor of a referendum, but not this referendum. They wanted another referendum that had been agreed with Madrid. And what does that mean? It means you have to agree with the Tories, and then we'll support you. Um, I mean, you can call it what you like, but assaulting heavens, which is what their slogan was at one stage, it's not. It's getting back into the old dirty business of reformists that end up being transformed by the system instead of transforming the system. On the international left, um, it's been better. Um, some of us in the social movements in Catalonia started what's called With Catalonia in the middle of, uh, early middle of, of October. Um, there was a meeting where a, a comrade from Dublin was there. In fact, she invented the name with Catalonia. I have to give her credit for that. Um, and it's a call to social movements across Europe and internationally to build solidarity with Catalonia. Because the Catalan government had been doing international work. The political parties had been doing international work. But the Catalan government had a, a, an orientation on talking to ministers and, and regional governments and so on, which is fine, but didn't get anywhere. The left independentist parties had relations with other left independentist parties in other countries, but again, it didn't really get very far. 
um, on the 1st of October, we got messages of solidarity, but didn't really count for much. What was missing was that link to the bulk of the left, the mainstream left and social movements across Europe, not just in Corsica or Ireland or Scotland, with all respect to those, those people, but actually to the mainstream of the left and, and social movements across Europe. And we put out a call, and in some places people have responded. I mean, there's comrades here from Poland. There's an active group of solidarity with the Catalan Republic in, 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 in Poland. There's a very active group in Scotland that's doing work around Ponsati at the moment. Uh, and there's initiatives in other places, but it's still very weak. Many parts of the European left still think this is like the Liga Nord in Italy. Just rich people that don't want to pay taxes to poor people. And, as I insist, it is nothing to do with that. It's a completely different sort of movement. If they think it's about racism, you say, well, we're talking about Barcelona, the city in Europe had the biggest demonstration in the whole of the continent in support of welcoming refugees. And there's all sorts of limitations about it, but like just last week, a boat went into to Barcelona. Um, I mean, in the movements there, we're raising questions. Again, great, we'll welcome these 60 refugees. And can we also welcome the refugees that came up by bus from Andalusia and have been living on the street for the last few weeks? So there's problems, but in any case, we're not talking about a movement that is racist and backward. We're talking about progressive movement, by and large, that the left is not able to see. And this is a serious problem we need to get over. Because if the left is not able to stand up to repression and imprisonment of political activists, peaceful political activists when it happens in Catalonia, who's going to stop it if it happens in Paris or London or Berlin or wherever? Um, already? Right. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll jump forward. Um, we had the referendum that was impressive. Um, the general strike on the 3rd of October was massively impressive. Um, the declarations that were then suspended of, 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 referendum, of, of independence were not so impressive. And here we are nearly nine months later, and we are evidently not independent. Uh, so something has gone wrong. So in the five minutes or so that Geraldine will leave me, uh, I'll, I'll try and summarize <laughs> what's gone wrong. Okay, firstly, um, national movements inevitably involve part of the national bourgeoisie. No problem. The trouble is you can't trust them. Because when push comes to shove, they'll step back. And we have seen that over and over again. And the most uh, the, uh, clear example was, was in October uh, with, with Puigdemont. Um, and because it was from the institutionalized parties, institutionalized independentist parties, they were saying, well, we can trust in democracy, we can trust that Spain will somehow have to agree with it, or the European Union will somehow support us. Look at what the European Union did in Greece. Look what they're doing with Frontex in the Mediterranean. So how are they going to be suddenly concerned about democracy in Catalonia? It's not going to happen. Um, and so we need a strategy that doesn't depend on the ruling class is based on the working class here, coming back to what Marina was saying. But here, I think we have to say there are also weaknesses on the radical left. The Corp, I have lots of friends and comrades in the Corp and a massive respect for the Corp. But even though it talks about the working class, in reality, it, it's still a left, I think it's still a left nationalist force. So you, they don't, I don't think, that they have an orientation on the working class as a class. It's more on, we want workers in the movement and to support independence, but if there's a worker strike, it's not we support it because we're socialist. It's, well, you know, sometimes we'll support it if we have members or if it's interesting, and other times we won't. And the tradition of, that I come from, which is the tradition of the SWP, is if there's a worker strike, you support it, and you're involved in that. In that. And then you can raise all sorts of political deba debates. But the, the class basis comes first, and the rest of the political demands flow from that. And I think often with a corp, it's you have your political program that comes first, and then sometimes it relates to workers here or there, and other times you won't. I don't know, I don't have time to explain more on that. Um, about the CDRs, they're impressive, but like in October, there were people coming out with all power to the CDRs, as if they were Soviets. And it's not, the CDRs are like the 15th of May movement, the Indignados movement. You have 100 people in a square, it's wonderful, all sorts of people. Some people, very weird people. And others are really sort of, yeah, there are some weird people, <laughs> and some of them really rooted activists. But it's not, it doesn't have roots in the working class as a class. Most of those people are working class, others are middle class and all sorts of things. But for example, the strike on the 3rd of October, the CDRs obviously supported it. But what made it into a strike by I don't know how many, it was millions of people or hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers, the Sayat factory closed. Um, because it was the big unions supported it. And that's what made it into a general strike. 
They didn't initiate it. They had to be pushed and pushed. But in the end, they supported it, and that made it a general strike. The 8th of November, there was supposedly a general strike with all the forces except the big unions, and it wasn't a general strike. It was impressive roadblocks and blocking the high-speed rail links that are now producing masses of fines and repression. So the key thing here is to see that something, I've, I've been a member, I joined the SWP in 1984, and it's about working class power. I've you know, repeated that phrase loads of times, I suspect. But the events in Catalonia in the autumn were, for, for me, a proof in practice in my own eyes, of what that really means. The difference between being able to close down the factories uh, and the schools and all the rest of it through workers' direct power and what you might call sort of people's power, that you have 100 people blocking a road, but the police can come along and smash you. The police couldn't smash the strike at Seat. Or when the rail workers close the railway lines, they're closed. If you have 50 people on a railway line, they can smash you out. So I think the ex events in Catalonia, and we had 2 million people in demonstrations. You can't get more people power than that. But I think it shows that that's, that's very positive, of course. But if we don't grow from that into having real roots in the real working class, not just on the national question, but on all, all the other things, then we, we won't win. In other words, people power isn't enough. We need workers' power. And so going back to the beginning, and something we're all agreed on, that 50% just is not enough. And if we now recognize that the Catalan bourgeoisie or the parties of the Catalan bourgeoisie are now taking a big step backwards, so we're not even on 50%. We should be on 80 or 90% because if working class people can see that the Republic <coughs> means better social services, more power over your own lives and all sorts of other things, then people will be for it. But in order to do that, I think we need a completely different strategy that isn't trying to govern I know Esquerra Republicana has done good things. I have massive respect for Esquerra Republicana. But if you're in the government with a right-wing party, then in the end, it's them that drag you and not vice versa. Uh, so I think all the, the comrades and sisters and brothers in Esquerra Republicana in government, good luck to them. But I think the comrades who are on the street, also in the movements, have a lot more possibilities to really change things. And so the last point is what we started off before the meeting, trying to sell our bulletins for Marx 21. We're a tiny, tiny group in the tendency of the SWP, but we're trying to raise those arguments in an organized way that change fundamentally comes from below, that the key force in bringing that change is the working class, that we need Marxist and revolutionary ideas based on socialism for below, but not on the idea of we lay down our, our ultimatum and you have to come to us. No, we have to be with the people in all the movements where we can get to. We need more people to get to more movements. We need to be part of those movements, but raising those sometimes hard arguments to say, look, things have gone wrong. We need to learn from the mistakes so that we get it right next time. If we don't learn from the mistakes, then it'll be that film Groundhog Day over again. Except, imagine Groundhog Day when the guy doesn't remember what happened the previous day. That's where we'd be. We need Groundhog Day. Well, if we're in Groundhog Day, okay. But let's, let's learn and try and overcome it, if you like. <laughs> this is an original <laughs> idea. The Revolutionary Party is a guy in Groundhog Day who's seen many similar things before and has to learn to try and change things. It's not easy, and sometimes it can get desperate, and sometimes you get impatient with people. But we need to try and patiently explain, patiently build, and build. There is no alternative to building from below on the basis of working class power. I'm a comrade from Dublin and I'm also a councillor and people for profit in Dublin City um, and it was a real honour actually to be out in Catalonia last year I was invited to come and observe the non-declaration there's supposed to be a declaration of the Republic on the 17th of October and it was just really inspiring to be there everything that you've heard described I visited people who had taken part in defending uh, schools and centres and um, there was one man actually his and his wife their story always stuck with me they were in a very small town uh, to the north of Girona and they were having a kind of a community lunch feast to celebrate the vote and uh, they were in the square having their lunch and next thing they just heard the stomp 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 of the police coming down the spanish police coming down the road and and they, they knew that they were coming for the ballot boxes but he said what chilled them the most was the absolute silence they came into the square and they went over to them and asked them what their business was there and they said they just didn't say a single word they just started battering them and, and spraying them with, 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 uh, with pepper spray and lunch tables and everything flying everywhere. And I've seen videos of it. And I think it, like that, obviously like, you know, that, that really impacts on, on communities. And you really got that sense there that whatever people's feelings were before the referendum, that the repression of the Spanish state 
has played into the hands of the Catalan people. And when I came home, I had a motion passed in Dublin City Council to have the Catalan flag fly over City Hall in Dublin for a month, uh, which was amazing. And uh, but it was, what was really interesting about it was that, that in the debates that followed, so everybody was up in arms. How could you possibly support the Catalan people? And what about the Spanish state? And what about the European Union? And of course, in the council and during the debate, it was the government parties that were absolutely outraged that I would even consider um, that, you know, of course the Catalan people have the right to vote, but it should be legal. And, you know, this is not a legal referendum and all this legality. But the real thing that scared them, and in, in, in Ireland, the, 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 the government parties wouldn't come out to condemn the violence because what really scared them was that if the Catalan people win, it's not just about the self-determination of the Catalan people, it's about the self-determination of every single person in the European Union who is currently being massively oppressed by the policies of the European <coughs> Union states. And that is why all the governments uh, in Europe, particularly in Ireland, supported um, the Spanish state and the absolute <coughs> barbaric brutality with which they have not only attacked the referendum, <coughs> but also uh, since then the, the repression and, and political prisoners. And we have, we've, we've joined up with the CDR in Dublin, there's a CDR there, and it's kind of it's cute in a way because they were saying to us, we don't have much experience of campaigning, you know, but we want to, and we're like, well, we do, so guess what? <laughs> this is a match made in heaven. Um, and we have continued to campaign there. We have, we have uh, pickets in, su in support with the prisoners. And we have music nights. We discovered on one of the pickets that there was Catalan uh, musicians and Irish musicians that just kind of started playing together. We were like, perfect. And I'll just finish on this because I think that, that like, what's, what's really important as well is we've just recently had a referendum in Ireland and we won the right to abortion and reproductive rights for women. Um, and that's viewed as legitimate because the benevolent ruling party granted us the referendum. And somehow the, the, the referendum in Catalonia is not seen as legitimate because the, the, you know, the ruling benevolent parties in, in, in Madrid didn't grant. But the point is the people spoke. The people spoke in Ireland and the people spoke in Catalonia. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no difference. And we have to stand in solidarity. When the people speak, that's where we have to be. I made a mistake, so please go that way. Whenever you have to talk, you can stay there. Okay, yeah. then. <laughs> That's the I got uh, uh, just really, uh, some questions, really. Um, my name is Pura. Um, my father came here in 1956 when he was fleeing from the Franco regime in Spain. And I think one of the hardest things has been look at seeing, again, the police state tactics which were used in terms of seizing ballot boxes and wading in, and also the silence, the silence from the EU and the support for it disgracefully from the PSOE and from Podemos, who I presume have committed suicide political suicide over their acts there. Of course, the inspirational thing is the movements and, and, and the Comités de la Defensa and all the rest of it. But actually, what I wanted to ask you have been about these wonderful women's demonstrations and strike that there have been recently. I lived in Spain in various times over my life, and in the 1980s, I was part of the women's movement, which was very strong. It was a time of strong movementism in Spain, which has got positives, but also got negatives because it doesn't have roots in, um, in the industrial working class or the organized working class, but nevertheless. And we've seen over time with this very right-wing government, them rolling back, and we've seen people go out on demonstrations on exactly the same demonstrations that we organised in the 1980s, which was a woman's right to choose over abortion. And, that, and it was quite chilling, really, because those were gains that we made in the 1980s, and they were rolled back, and they were demonstrating again. Now, I've got to say that over the women's strike on the 8th of March, I wasn't very excited about it. I thought, oh, that's a bit, what's that a women's strike? What would that be? I mean, you know, it's a bit... And it was just absolutely electric. It was magnificent. My friends were phoning me from Spain saying, we haven't seen anything like this for such a long time. And then the other demonstrations that there were over La Manada, which was that group of, um, uh, of men who carried out a gang rape and also filmed it and were also let off because the judiciary doesn't see that as being a major crime. And again, my friends were phoning me and saying, you've got to get out, this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, so in terms of the movements, what people are doing, but the, the potential for organising the movements and for organising the movements around something because Catalan nationalism is kind of like your subtitle, even though, as you're saying, it's not specific, actually about nationalism, but as it, that is the sort of strap line that it gets. I'm interested to know, and I'm interested to know more about where that fantastic wave of angry women in the streets came from, because I think it's something for the future. Okay. Hi, I, I tried to speak in English, but <laughs> I <don't> speak in English. <laughs> I'm from a committee of defense of the republic. Um, like I wanted to to say that 
other uh, sederas tam, uh, also <laughs> out of Catalonia uh, and every country of Europe. Uh, if someone is interested, like you can look at the Twitter, you find the era the the uh, of cities, I see. Uh, mm, there is also uh, all the little uh, uh, you said. <laughs> there is uh, exile. There is um, two rappers. 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 Uh, well, one is there is one is uh, waiting for the um, for uh, go to the prison a uh, Pablo Hassel and there is also um, una persona de, de CDR uh, who had to to flee to see uh, because uh, they are uh, watching for him uh, Catalonia. Um, Talking of, of violence, um, there is two violence, uh, uh, violence of uh, gr um, groups, uh, fascistas. Fascist groups. Fascist groups, thank you. <laughs> and like, uh, they can do what they want, and the police uh, no, no, no do. Mm. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't do anything. <laughs> Doesn't do anything, and uh, when, uh, we do something, uh, arrives up the police, and and then the, uh, the the Catalan police, and and this point um, I would like to to add uh, like la la marina que said uh, like the the Catalan gover government uh, doesn't do uh, what they they say. The, um, this example like the Catalan police. Um, do the um, play with sim com, it seems that she plays with uh, fascism or I mean with que no sé como dir, que la, la policía catalana los Mossos que van protegiendo a los fascistas o a los unionistas en contra de nosotras yeah but now the Catalan police is controlled by the Catalan government but it seems they defend the fascists and the pro-Spanish centralists and, uh, and don't defend uh, independentists Eh, eh, y para acabar de la campaña del 21D, que, que mientras hacíamos la campaña del 21D, por ejemplo, en la CUP, que nos ven, eh, venían a identificar mientras hacíamos campaña y que eso no es democracia. Oh, the, during the election campaign, uh, when the Catalan police were controlled by Spanish government, uh, the, the, the police were harassing people during the uh, pro-independence election campaign, but did nothing against the fascists. Thank you. Hi, Hans Peter, I'm a supporter of the International Bolshevik Tendency. Um, I fully agree with the comments of um, the speaker on the right who made it clear that obviously we have to look towards um, the working class as Marxists as, and that, take that perspective primarily. And I think um, that's how Lenin approached the national question. It's always been around building revolutionary consciousness rather than just tailing any national movement. So. Um, in the 1930s, for example, Trotsky advised against Catalan independence because the working class in Spain, including Catalan, Catalonia, were working together and the Spanish Revolution emerged at the horizon. So he was in no circumstance, circumstance against it. I think today uh, it's correct to, to um, support independence, especially after the massive police repression and the fact that the majority of the Catalan people um, are for independence. But the national movement in itself is not necessarily a progressive movement. Um, Esquerra Republicana, for example, in the 1930s was the element that Trotsky called the bourgeois element that tr transformed the government, the Republican government, into a popular front government and worked together with the Stalinists and the Social Democrats to actually prevent the re revolution and collectivizations from happening. So um, those are the dangers that we need to be aware of. So in terms of the long-term perspective, um, demanding independence needs to be built on the basis of working class unity internationally. Thank you.
People here may know that we in DSWP threw ourselves in building solidarity with the Catalan movement before and following the referendum. We held organized protests in solidarity with the movement for the release of the political prisoners and so on. And we have also organized dozens of meetings up and down the country uh, to raise awareness of what was happening. So, you know, not, no one should doubt of where we stand in complete solidarity with the movement and with those fighting for independence and completely behind the demand of, you know, for, re for the release of the political prisoners. But today we are among revolutionaries and I think that, you know, a self-critical assessment of what's happened is, 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 a, is a revolutionary uh, duty. Um, and that's what I want to talk about because, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, along the lines of the previous speaker, Lenin and Trotsky argued that socialist in the Tsarist Russian Empire should support the right of small nations to self-determination. You know, they called Russia the, the prison house of nations, uh, and they argued that supporting these movements, you know, the socialist involvement in them, would uh, first of all weaken the imperialist and the great cap capitalist powers, but also it would weaken the hold of the, of the ideology of the ruling class on, you know, on, on the working class of the, of the oppressing country. Um, but they also argue that in the world today, I mean, a hundred years ago, but also today, the bourgeoisie um, across the world had lost all traces of the, of the revolutionary character that they may have had in the past, you know, when they fought against the old uh, feudal order. So this meant that the bourgeoisie could initiate some of these national movements, uh, or, I mean, all of them actually, um, but at some point, when faced with all this state machine and the power of the capitalist state, they would find themselves you know, trapped in, in, in contradictions that would force them at some point to compromise with the, with the order they were trying to, to fight. This meant that um, for workers and for, for the movement to win, they could be involved, but uh, you know, they would try to fight they, they would have to retain um, their own independence and fight for a strategy of their own. A strategy also that, you know, wouldn't, be, wouldn't focus on the fight for, in, for, for national independence, but it would try to uh, turn it into a fight for workers' power. Um, and my impression is that this has been a failure in, 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 in Catalonia. It has failed to happen because after the referendum, um, Rajoy, uh, you know, the, the, the president of, of the PP, the ruling party, um, happily gone now, um, was absolutely right. helpless, helpless, you know. No one should see his, you know, his resort to repression and brutal measures as a sign of, of a strength. It was the opposite. It was a, a, a desperate attempt to stop a movement that he didn't know how to, how to stop. So for some time, you know, you could see that which the Mont and the Catalan leaders of the movement hesitating and not knowing how to how to go go forward, good, um, and and the masses looking for you know look, looking to them for a for, for a strategy. This didn't happen, and unfortunately, I think that in the, you know within those weeks, the left could have provided an alternative that could have given voice to th to, to the hundreds of thousands, um, you know, looking for the result of a referendum to be implemented. Um, at some point, of course, because this situation couldn't last, finishing, um, Rajoy took the offensive and it was from that point on that we saw uh, the imprisonment of leading campaigners, of grassroots activists, elected politicians, and so on, the imposition of direct rule, um, and the current situation, the growth of fascism also across the country. Um, so the final point I want to make is that this doesn't mean that the movement has been crashed or defeated permanently, but it does mean that, you know, when it gains momentum again, and that's very likely to happen at any point soon with it, because the, the, the new socialist government is not going to solve in any way the crisis, of, the crisis of the Spanish government, it's fundamental for socialists to learn the lessons from October and November, um, and not see this as a movement, you know, not, not, not to subordinate the struggle for a, for a different society to the national movement, but to use the fight for independence to fight for a completely different society.
sorry. I have time for just, this is, I think, the last contribution, because otherwise we're going to run late. So let me keep it very short. And maybe <laughs> okay. I can keep um, someone else. I just wanted to bring in a little bit about the impact that this has had in Scotland. Um, because I think I wanted to thank all the speakers for coming over and being part of this debate. It's been really good to hear what's been going on. There's lessons in us all, I think, for about, about state power and with the lengths that our rulers will go to. And there's lessons, there's lessons in particular for Scotland, the independence movement in Scotland, because Catalonia was a, was a beacon, I think, for a lot of people in the independence movement in Scotland. You see the, the, you see the flags on the demonstrations all the time. You walk around the local area where I live in the south side of Glasgow, you see Catalonia flags in people's windows. Um, the main thing I suppose I need to come short on this, don't I? When we saw the violent repression, there was mass revulsion across society in Scotland and people were looking to the SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, for uh, a lead to, to see Nicola Sturgeon, the, the leader of the SNP, actually condemn what she was seeing going on, but it was so muted, it was so silent, that people were starting to get frustrated and like, we should also criticise the Labour Party here as well because there was absolutely virtually virtual silence from the Labour Party. The Scottish Labour Party leadership don't, don't go up, want to go anywhere near this issue because it opens a whole can of worms for them. Or you support self-determination in Catalonia, do you? Or does that mean you support self-determination in Scotland and will you support a second independence referendum in Scotland? Um, it also brought in a lot of unease and shook people's faith in the European Union. I've, I've witnessed so many people and SNP activists, independence activists, that ha they thought the, the EU was something else, but it's been utterly exposed for the undemocratic institutions that it is. Um, I'll try and be short. We, we, we've, we were organising a lot of solidarity in Scotland. We built a little coalition called the Catalan Defence Committee, working with SNP activists, working with Unison Union activists, working with people in no party, but they wanted to show a bit of solidarity. And we focused on purely the issue of fighting for democracy, fighting to, de to, to defend democratic rights. Um, we had small successes, you know, little demonstrations, but we managed to push, because we were trying to pull people who didn't support independence for Scotland or Catalonia into that, we managed to get it through the Scottish trade union movement, and the trade unions were way ahead of the SNP leadership. Because of the work that we did, we managed to get them to come out. The Scottish Trade Union Congress now has an official position to demand the immediate release and acquittal of all the political prisoners in Catalonia. So now we're focusing on solidarity for Clara Ponsati on the 30th of July. If anybody's gone up for the Edinburgh Festival, 30th of July, come join the protest, Edinburgh Sheriff Court, um, and I'll stop there because you want me to finish. And I wanted to ask that comrade with the white shirt, you, no, no, uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You with the glasses. Sorry. Can I just quickly ask from here? Yes, of course. Yes. Um, my, my name's Roxanne. I'm also a supporter of the, the International Bolshevik Tendency. Um, I, again, really agree with the, um, the way the comrades talked about the necessity to, to defend against the state brutality and that this became synonymous with uh, the right to self-determination. It's the same thing because if you're defending that, then we, we have to be behind that. There, there was no other choice. Um, but I wanted to ask a question about whether those people based in Spain, do you really, um, from, from afar it looks like, unfortunately though, that it is still a reflection of a lack of class consciousness, the way that this has manifest. Even though it's not a nationalist movement, like the, uh, the comrades said, it's not a, a right wing movement, but it does have a petty bourgeois leadership to a certain extent, obviously, and there are those people who's, who bend the stick the other way, putting emphasis on the inherently revolutionary dynamic of a nationalist movement, or let's not use the word nationalist, of a, um, a movement for self-determination. And actually, I feel like it's channeling working class um, disgust with the system, and it's actually misusing that energy um, and so I'm, I'm making a separate point from the police brutality. I'm saying, is this not also, unfortunately, a sign of a lack of class consciousness, actually? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. And unfortunately, I have to um, ask the speakers to sum up. David. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> uh, the final question, I think any, any movement that isn't, we want a Marxist socialist revolution in some ways, deviates from some sort of norm. 
But I think in any movement, like the anti-war movement, anti-racist movement, we have to do as, as Marxist revolution, participate in that and try and show the relevance of class politics to winning that struggle. It's not a question of saying, you know, you're on the wrong track. Um, the, the dilemmas about um, class and independence and uh, uh, social questions, there was an excellent meeting yesterday by Ronnie Castro's from South Africa who mentioned how it's a massive dilemma, life and death issue for them, and I think in some ways things didn't go well in South Africa and in Catalonia, obviously there, there are problems. I think we come back to the question of we need to build a left based on class struggle, um, both in Catalonia and in Spain, and on real class struggle, not on putting up uh, uh, ultimatums, uh, uh, not on simply, when, simply liquidating our, ourselves into whatever the latest opinion polls do, say, which is uh, the position of, of Podemos. Um, and I think, basically, it's tough. Um, there's, if only there were easy answers, but I think, really, um, in a sense, we have to go back to doing the, the basic level work. There, as Hector said before, there will almost certainly be some sort of explosion. Um, we need to be in the best position possible for that. I think in October, I think the left wasn't in a position to say, okay, we're going to lead the working class forward to independence without the bourgeoisie, simply because there wasn't a left capable of doing that or oriented on doing that. I mean, even um, in the, the long battles about who should be president, it end up being Kim Torra, who's got a history of really some very backward ideas, who's currently a Catalan president, which doesn't reflect the real movement. But um, the, one of the last forces to say, OK, we'll forget about Puigdemont as president, was the coup. So you had the coup from the radical left saying, we insist that this bourgeois politician be our president. So I think there's, there's probably we need to try and find some way of going beyond that. And there's no easy way. Um, and the, the final thing is, the international solidarity is very important. Ramey and other people in Scotland have done brilliant work in other places around. But I think one key area is the Spanish state. And again, the weakness of the left in the Spanish state. And it's not just the same as Scotland or France or Germany. I mean, we're currently part of the same state. We have the same new government of the Socialist Party with all its contradictions and massive weakness, in fact. So it's an opportunity. I mean, the demand for Catalan independence and a Catalan republic is a massive opportunity for the Spanish left to break on the one hand with the monarchy itself, but also with the, all the social uh, 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 limitations of the current uh, state in, Catalu in a Spanish state. The problem is the weakness of the left. I mean, we have Podemos, we have the different sections of the left inside Podemos, battling for power within Podemos. And there's a real lack of a left rooted in working class struggle in the neighborhoods. But <laughs> things that the SWP takes for granted and, and other comrades, you, you're in the street every Saturday selling papers, talking to ordinary people. That sort of left rooted in the neighborhoods and the working place, workplaces, there is no alternative to building that sort of left. And if we're a handful of people, well, we'll be a handful of people trying to talk to many more handfuls of people. But there's no alternative to that building from the bottom. And I think the experience of Catalonia it's not over. There'll be lots more news, and please give your solidarity when it's called for. But as part of that struggle, we need to build that revolutionary left. Thank you, David. Marie. Um, first of all, thank you for your international solidarity. Dublin, Glasgow, uh, here in London, this is very great and so helpful for the Catalans that are not having a hard time over there. Um, I wanted to add, maybe to the same question, um, the end that, um, well, liberals actually, Junts per Catalunya and Puigdemont, they're not conservative, they're liberals. Liberals are free to advocate for Catalan independence as well. That's what democracy is about. So if they gain elections, maybe we as a left-wing uh, party, we need to work better in order to gain uh, elections. Win. Or to win. <laughs> but um, then, and I have to, uh, to add something else, that the, the greatness of the, of the Catalan independence movement also roots in the fact that people and villages, they gather and debate on the political future, independently if they are from a bourgeoisie background or working class people. That's the, the revolutionary moment, I think. I've never seen before in my life. And I think that's the greatness of the movement as well. Um, if we want to be strong as a left mid movement, we have to work on, on our own. We can't uh, wait for solutions from outside. 
um, on the exiled rappers and uh, the member of the CDR that's on ex in exile as well. No, I think we don't know where he is. He disappeared uh, um, and went abroad somewhere. This is really something I'm really considering. Uh, we don't want this in the 21st century, and the EU should have a word on that. I know that there are after cl uh, in, um, behind uh, closed doors, there are conversations going on, but we need to we need to be we need to this topic to be public. We can't accept people exiled and imprisoned just because of their political ideas. <coughs> Thank you, Marie. Marina. I think you want David yeah. to translate, or yeah. yeah? Okay. <laughs> no, que per mi és important que o sigui, venim d'un procés on la punta de llança contra el règim del 78 ha estat el moviment independentista. Okay, so we're in a situation where the, the, the key center of the struggle against the, the Spanish regime of 1978, the current constitution, uh, that, that key point of that is the um, Catalan movement. I que hi ha moments a la història que no ha set així que per això la tàctica de l'independentisme ha anat canviant. And there's been other times in history when that hasn't been the situation. For that reason we have to adapt to our strategies. Però que el dret a l'autodeterminació com a marxistes l'hem de defensar sempre. But as Marxists we have to defend the right to self-determination always. Sí, i bàsicament que jo crec que hi ha hagut una campanya des dels mass media, des de tota la ideologia dominant, de separar el conflicte en qüestió de nacionalismes, de sentiments. Llavors estava per una banda l'Espanyol tal, per altra banda. No. And I think there's been a strategy from from the mass media, for example, to try and paint all this as a question of uh, nationalist identities and uh, nationalist feelings between Catalan feelings and Spanish feelings. I que llavors, davant d'aquest debat, molta gent de la classe treballadora es posiciona amb, amb el sentiment espanyolista. And so, on that if you pose it in that way, then a lot of working class people in Catalonia do feel that they are mainly Spanish. I que també hi ha molta por, no?, a perdre com aquesta seguretat, però que nosaltres, la, o sigui, per nosaltres, bueno, almenys per mi, la clau està en capgirar això i donar-li la volta en clau de defensar els drets humans i els drets socials i construir aquesta consciència de classe. Um. <laughs> Uh, 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 and so, yes, a lot of working people do accept the idea, you know, well, we feel Spanish because then we feel safe with that, and that's how things have always been. And so the challenge for the left is to turn all that right round and say this is about social change uh, and all the rest of it. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. 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 No, és igual, està bé. <laughs> bueno, i que merci per la solidaritat internacional, que és sempre sendible per guanyar. Thanks a lot for the international solidarity, which is essential in order to win.